Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal here is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Hi everyone, this week we're going to switch it up a bit and play for you the audio portion of one of our IEW webinars. Because the webinar itself is over an hour, we're splitting it into two parts, but we'll post both of them this week. And we'll post any links or websites mentioned in this recording at IEW.com slash podcast. Enjoy! You're asking how long should each lesson take and how often should the lesson be taught? Here's the rule of thumb. The lesson should not be longer than the attention span of the student. The lessons should be taught as often as you are able and you don't have to worry about you know finishing the book in a year or going at a certain speed or doing a certain number of assignments. You want to be sure that your student is being successful, you're helping them as much as possible, you're not exhausting him or her. You know, obviously, if it's a co-op and you have a group together, then you're going to have a schedule. Okay, we're going to meet for an hour and 15 minutes, whatever that schedule dictates. But in your case, it sounds like you're talking about customizing it at home. And I would never answer the question. You have to answer it for yourself. So, sorry, <laughs> I wish I could have a magic wand and know everybody's situation perfectly. Here's a great one. How long till a 10-year-old boy can write on his own without parent help? That would probably be somewhere between a week and 10 years. That would be my estimate. So if you're in that zone, then you're probably okay. You might start getting really nervous around 17. But actually, I've known kids who, who hardly wrote anything until they were teenagers. My son did not read anything until he was 11. He didn't read a book until he was 12. He didn't write anything independently till he was 12 because he had extreme dyslexia. Maybe, Julie, you could put up a link to what to do when your child can't write a talk. I think we have that one. And also the four language arts would be helpful. But the number one thing is don't stress on that. And the time frame is just not something you can change. You cannot possibly do anything yourself to make him be able to to be independent any faster other than to continue to help him as much as he needs. So, oh boy, question, a lot of questions. Andrew, you mentioned that students should memorize the story sequence chart, that they memorize the other chart info for the other units too. Yeah, basically they do. I mean, there's nothing really to memorize in the keyword outline except three, fa you know, three words max per sentence. Unit four is the topic clincher rule. So yes, I have them memorize that. Unit five isn't terribly difficult, but I want them to be able to say, you know, who, when, where, why, how, you know, have those question words on the tip of their tongue, tip of their brain. And then I did, would have them memorize the essay models as well, but not all necessarily perfectly in one year, you know, depending on where they are. Judy. First year student struggling with first drafts with dress ups and complete sentences at the same time. You may be introducing the dress ups too quickly. If that's the case, just shorten the checklist. If doing an LY who which strong verb and a quality adjective is driving you crazy, then just drop it back and just do the LY who which until that's easy. We have to talk a little bit about style. We have a writing source packet and you can download that very easily. It's part of your premium subscription, and it's got lots of stories to use. They're readily available, easy to choose and elaborate and change. Then, of course, if you're using one of the theme-based writing lessons kind of in the homeschool co-op world, or if you have the set of classroom supplements for the classroom teachers, these provide well-fleshed-out lesson plans to go with the source stories. So. Those are some sources we provide. You can also use literature. One of the benefits, of course, of using literature is you can connect with other things you're reading. It improves comprehension. 
you've got, you know, hopefully a room full of books somewhere in your life. I would say that working with literature, it's harder to identify and limit the story sequence chart components. And of course, if you're retelling a story that was in a book, you may feel awkward changing things. So a little more difficult to do that. Very quickly, this is in, if you have the old version, in the tips and tricks. If you have the new version, it's in your Unit 3 section. But this is just some different ways to use the Unit 3 story sequence chart. Number one, if you've got young children, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, whatever, you can just use it as a discussion tool and ask the questions on the story sequence chart to the students after they read a story or after you read them a story and just have a discussion. Who's in the story? Who's also in the story? What's that character like? What's his personality? What what does he what does he want or need? Where is he? Where is the circumstance? What else is there? You can ask those questions and you can start getting the kids to think a little bit analytically about a story by using the story sequence chart as just a discussion tool with very young children. You can also notice that if you are aware of Adam Andrews teaching the classics, his discussion tools really begin with the elements of the story sequence chart and then expand them into more developed areas like theme and style. But in the beginning, same thing. Now, you can write a straight summary from the story sequence chart. That's when you just basically tell the story as it was. You leave out stuff if the first one was too long, but you don't change anything. So if you're retelling, say, an historical event or a, an historical thing that happened, say, in the Bible, you don't want to go changing that because that would distort the accuracy of the story for the reader. Although it seems to be very popular now for modern textbook writers to change history by distorting the stories, but uh, we'll leave that to the experts. I like to start with this one here, elaboration. That's my little arrow. I like to start where you have a story that allows for a small change. Fables, myths, fairy tales, legends. These are all stories that have been told, retold, in many ways, in different ways, over decades, centuries, or millennia. And there's really nothing wrong with doing that because if there were, if taking a story and retelling it in a different way, if that were a crime or something, well, you'd have to put Nathaniel Hawthorne and C.S. Lewis and the entire Disney Corporation in jail for you know stealing stories. But sometimes Disney makes very painful variations on the stories they steal. So that's kind of the nice place to start. And what you'll see in the seminar workbook is quite a number of the student samples do that. They will keep, say, the hare and the tortoise, but they'll change some little thing about it. The hare, instead of falling asleep, decided to play Pokemon Go on his phone and got lost because he was chasing pokies. You know, okay, that's the same basic character, the same basic problem, but a variation on why the hare doesn't win. You can also then, with the elaboration, with the variation, you can actually change the characters. So instead of the boy who cried wolf, well, why not a girl, goat herd, in Africa who cried lion? Or you can flip it and say the wolf who cried boy or the wolf who cried hunter. Here we see uh, this actually is a published book, I've been told, The Boy Who Cried Alien. So we don't know what that is. But that story is so well known, it becomes a metaphor for uh, evaluating behavior of people. And so retelling myths and fables in different settings, in modern settings, in different historical settings, makes a lot of sense because that's what they are. They're fables, which means they are timeless, uh, of timeless value. Then you can try the opposite. Instead of changing the characters and keep the problem, keep the characters and give them a new problem. Aha, the continuing adventures of the hare and the tortoise. Now, the tortoise is all running around cocky thinking he's at the top of the world because he beat the hare, and the hare's got to do something and something brings, the, you know, brings down the tortoise a notch. And, so you have a new problem. Cross-genre can change a poem to a story or a story to a poem. 
I have an example of that. We're going to skip it tonight, but you can go to the old webinar and look at it. You can also read a couple of these in the seminar workbook. But that's fun to do an off-checklist assignment, too. Say, hey, here's a story. Write it into a poem. Don't worry about dress-ups. Don't worry about style techniques. Just try to make the poem work and you know, talk about some rhyme schemes, maybe. You can also take a poem and rewrite it in prose as a story, a poem that, say, tells a story, like the Jabberwocky or Casey at the Bat or something like that. You can expand the story beyond three paragraphs. I probably wouldn't push this on anyone just because I personally don't really like writing fiction all that much. But if you had a student who loves to write stories, wants to write more involved stories, you could certainly have you know, one paragraph about one character and another whole paragraph about another character. Right? Give the backstory on all those characters. And then you could have you know, maybe three paragraphs for the problem and the development and what they say, what they do, just adding in a lot more detail, maybe a couple extra obstacles. And then a paragraph, a whole paragraph, just for the climax moment. And then another one for your, your denouement and your message commentary, if you have any. So you could easily make the three-paragraph, three-part model into a six- or seven-paragraph story. And if you want to go longer than that, I would recommend Lee Roddy's book, How to Write a Story. He kind of takes that story sequence chart and fleshes it out in great detail. And then you can use the story sequence chart as an original story and make up, i.e. find something in your brain with characters in the setting and a problem and a resolution. So those are ways to use the Unit 3 Story Sequence Chart. And like I said, we have some great examples, particularly of the elaboration and the variation in the new seminar workbook. Oh, here we have, you know, so instead of the boy wolf, you could have the girl and the lion, the dog and the cat, the sentry and the enemy, the wolf, the boy, the astronaut, the alien. I even had one student, this is a, years ago, probably 02, 03, right after you know the 9-11 and then the invasion of uh, Iraq, he wrote, the president who cried weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> that was his story. His mom was very disturbed. But I was very impressed that he could see the comparison between the story and what was going on in the news in real life at the time, rather than the ant who stores up food diligently in the grasshopper who dances away and then starves in the winter. You could look at a bear and a beaver. You could look at you know, a brother and a sister who does their chores. One gets rewarded, one doesn't. You could look at an investor who you know, carefully invests money slowly at a reasonable interest rate versus a speculator. <laughs> Homeschool moms, the one who's planned out the school year, ordered all the supplies, scheduled the webinars with IEW, and the mom who says, ah, who has to plan, we'll be fine. And then, uh, you know, 10 years later, your kids are full scholarship to any college they want, and hers are, uh, you know, trying to get a job at uh, in and out Burger or someplace. So a lot of options there, as you can see. I'm not going to do the poem story tonight. I love this idea. I actually rewrote this poem, Lock and Barbus or Walter Scott, into a three-paragraph story with all the dress-ups, openers, and following all the rules. The key rule, and, and this is where some of you who ask questions need to pay special attention here, the rule is that you only introduce a new stylistic technique when what has been learned has become easy. Easy, by my definition, means the student can do that, put that technique into a paragraph without much help, and it doesn't sound too goofy most of the time. Now, if you have a class, as I said, or you are using a theme-based book, it will give you a checklist at a certain speed. It will add a new technique when it decides to do so, completely oblivious to whether your students can do what has been taught so far easily or not. Why? It can't know. Workbook is an oxymoron. It does no work. You have to do the work. So if you need to adjust the checklist, that is perfectly fine. You can go right into medieval history-based writing lesson or whatever you're using and cross something off the checklist, and that is completely OK. There is no rule that says that everyone has to be on the same speed, doing the same thing, according to the same schedule. So that being said, OK, if the checklist is consists only of those things which are easy, plus one new thing, then he won't complain. If he complains, says it's too hard, it's too tough, there's too many things, he's really saying 
you taught me too much too fast. So backtrack. The units we march through according to the schedule. So unit one and two, September, great. Unit three, October. You don't have to master unit three. You don't have to have the story sequence chart memorized and do it all independently in order to go to unit four. They're not cumulative. You can do unit three as best you can, get help all the way, hit unit four, okay, new idea, topic, clincher, paragraph, summarize, take some of the facts, not all of them, and you can do unit four without total mastery of unit three. Same thing, you can go on to unit five without total mastery of unit three and four. They're not cumulative, they're different, right? However, the stylistic techniques are cumulative, and that's why they are dripped in as you go, dripped in as they become easy. So here you see you know, a little animation of what would be a pretty fast sequence, probably for an upper, middle, or high school student, dripping in all the stylistic techniques, dress-ups, openers, decoration, almost all of it by the end of the school year. If you have a student that's going much slower, then you would have a very much slower dripping in. And maybe, maybe if you're working with grade four or something, you only get to the fourth dress up by the end of the year. That would be okay. Better too slow than too fast. You have another year. You have another year after that. You have plenty of time. So don't stress the students. Our schedule basically shows that, you know, in level A, we work up to these two or three things. In level B, you might work up to those four to six things, depending if it was a second year student, third year student. In level C, you might work up faster into the sentence openers by the time you're in unit three. Okay, that, that would be an approximate schedule, but I don't really like putting it there because then you think, oh no, you know, I have a, you know, a grade nine student and he's really still struggling with the dress ups and we haven't started the sentence openers, we must be behind. Forget it. Relax. Do what you can do. Do what you can do until it's easy, until you can do it pretty well, and don't compare based on age or level or grade or anything like that. Follow the basic principle. Everybody say it together. Easy plus one. That's what the style checklist is. What's easy plus one thing and no more. So they get dripped in. Here's a faster pace. Oh, we don't have a slower pace. We need the slower pace. That's what we need. Okay. So just to finish up, we do have some helps for you. The Magnum Opus magazine comes out every other month, and it is five times a year, an, an e-version where you can read it uh, online or, or print it out if you wish. And then once a year, we do a print version. And your students are welcome to submit work to the Magnum Opus magazine. So save that link so that you can read back issues and subscribe. It's free, so don't feel like that's uh, cost anything at all, but it's a good source of, of student samples. More things, uh, aesopfables.com. Great, has all 180 some Aesop fables and every Hans Christian Andersen story. James Baldwin wrote fantastic little stories like Robert the Bruce, you know, about 400, 350, 400 words. So it's very manageable length, easy to make the outlines from, connected with legends and history and, and things in history. So you can, hopefully that link still works. You can get Baldwin stories. They're all public domain. He wrote them 100 years ago. Lee Roddy's book, How to Write a Story, and Lee Roddy's book, Guide to Writing Your Novel. And then, of course, the ways we can help you, podcasts, webinars, blogs, forums, e-newsletter, all that stuff. Some of you are, are old-timers around here, and you're already deep into what we offer. The uh, podcast is really going well. Julie and I are having a great time doing that. We're able to spend in a more relaxed way a good solid 20 minutes or so on a smaller question uh, on you know issues, particular types of dyslexic issues or learning disabilities, specific questions. And every 10 episodes, I think we do an Ask Andrew Anything question podcast. So I'd encourage you to check that out. It's been a lot of fun. I think you might enjoy it. All right. I'm going to zip through the rest of these questions here. So if you have a question up, Danielle, Angela, Jennifer, Jennifer, Judy, Jennifer, Janet, Dr. Ware 77, or Lynette, I will get to your question. But for those of you who want to move on uh, to the rest of your evening, I thank you for being here. So how many sentences do you have in the keyword outline if they don't correspond to the sentences I need one to? The, the answer is y you can have as many or few as you want. An interesting thing, if you have a student 
that has learned more style techniques. You might need more content in the outline to help them accomplish that. If you've just got two or three style techniques, you can put those in one sentence pretty easily. Not that you should, but that you could. But if you've got you know all five dress-ups and four sentence openers, you may need more content in order to do all those things in one paragraph. I in my outlines generally put four lines. Sometimes squeeze in a fifth line. You could squeeze in a sixth or seventh line if you want to. The thing and the reason it doesn't really matter is because the outline is only a starting point. And when the students start writing the story, if they get an idea of something they want to add into that story, because and it wasn't on the outline, no problem. They're not locked to the outline. They can improvise as they go. Now, if you have a student who, like I said, has a lot of style techniques to do, is not likely to come up with a new idea or improvise on the fly, well, you might want to help that student prepare more content in advance. But what I find is that most kids, they kind of start with that outline, they get into it, and then they get more ideas. They just add it in. And so there isn't a, uh, generally, there isn't a shortage of content. But I would say minimum three sentences per paragraph. That would be the minimum and no real maximum. Although, you know, some people write 500 word paragraphs, but nobody wants to read them. I hope that helps. Angela, I have a very hesitant writer. Can we do a lot of this orally or is the mastery to write this out? Well, it would depend on the age, Angela. I'm guessing, you know, if this is a younger boy, seven, eight year old boy or something, maybe even nine or ten. Yeah, just do it together. I would say write it out together on the whiteboard and then let him copy it over as copy practice, you know, just copying. Straight copying is very good for hesitant writers, writers who need more stamina. I had my son just do 20 minutes of copying for 16 months. That was before he could actually read or write independently much at all. I said, well, he may not be able to read, but he's going to write. I'm the writing guy. My son's going to write. And the copy work was actually very good discipline. It helped him get over, I think, the hump of just being able to put letters on paper. And and he had to be careful to, to win the, the game that I had set up for him. So, yes, you can do it orally. Yes, you want to encourage him in the writing. He, if he's on the young side, don't stress over it. If he's a little bit older, but you're so stressed, just do everything together, and don't don't worry. You know, you can't help too much because your child will always tell you when he doesn't need help anymore. So don't withhold help. That's one of the deadly errors. Jennifer, do you have them do the keyword outline all in one day, or is it a paragraph a day? Okay, whatever you have time for. You know, if you want to do 10 minutes and quit and go do something else and go for that speed. Fine, no problem. As I said, if you have a class and you structure the time, okay, we've got an hour, and we don't have every day, then you have to, you know, hunker down and concentrate a little bit more. But yeah, there's no rule about how much of any one assignment you have to do in any day. The general and best rule of thumb that I can give you is try to stop before the students are exhausted. You know, try to stop before the attention span has died out. Another Jennifer for a high school student is an entire chapter of, say, The Hobbit too long of a source text. Well, the problem with one chapter of The Hobbit is it may not have the elements of a story. It, it probably has some characters and setting, but those might have been all established long ago. It may or may not have a problem and a solution to it. So it may or may not fit into the story sequence chart. And because of that, it could be hard to do. It's also quite long, and so you could try it, and it might be a good challenge for a high school student, but you'd have to be really flexible with the way it was done and not worry too much about whether you did it right or not, simply because the elements of the story wouldn't be all that clear. And that's true for any novel. You know, a lot of novels, they have one big problem. They may have other small problems, but they're not necessarily divided up by chapter. I would probably start with shorter stories and not try to summarize an entire chapter uh, from Tolkien, unless you enjoy pain and suffering, which some people do, so you can decide. I don't, 
I don't know. We I did one time just to prove that it could be done to a group of teachers. <laughs> summarize. Uh, we rewrote the entire movie of the Wiz Wizard of Oz in three paragraphs. It can be done. You have to leave out a tremendous amount of stuff, <laughs> but it can be done. So it's an order of thinking that is challenging to children, young children, children who take things literally, children whose limiting skills are still developing. Judy, notice students are also overwhelmed with story sequence, sentence order sequence, and make sense with their sentences. Whew, well, I have to say I'm overwhelmed with your sentence there, Judy. All I can say is that I think what you'll need with them is just a little more modeling, just to do more together with them so that what they are doing is making sense because you're kind of guaranteeing that it is making sense. And don't expect them to make sense on their own without sufficient modeling. I think very often, particularly our teaching style in this country, is to try and explain something and say, now go do it. And then if it doesn't work, figure out, well, how come they couldn't do it? Whereas if we were to do it together and do it together again and model and model and model, then pretty soon the students go, oh, I, I see. I get the hang of it. I learn by doing it, not just by being told how to do it. So try that. Also understand the young children often don't make sense about many things. And Lynette, my daughter likes to have dialogue in her stories. As each character speaks, she starts a new paragraph. What is your recommendation? Yes, I talk about that in the seminar. And uh, the, the distinction here would be you can have structural paragraphs. And there's three of them. But if you want to call them mini chapters, you could do that too. Then you can have a conversational indentations. That's when you indent when the speaker changes. And the way to format that, I would suggest, is that you use block paragraph for the structural paragraphs or mini chapters. So you'd have a like a double-double space after the end of the first paragraph. Then the next paragraph, they're going to have this conversation. You've got all these indentations going on. When they get to the end of that, there's a double-double space. And then the third mini chapter, third paragraph mini chapter, would have that extra space and then if there were dialogue you could do that. So I just make the distinction between structural paragraphs and conversational indentations and you can communicate what that the words as, as best would help you and that's worked pretty well for most of us. Deborah, my kids are feeling overwhelmed with the dress ups but are doing well with the sentence openers. Can I back off on the other dress ups and focus on the sentence openers until they're easy? Girls 12 and 14. Oh, I wouldn't do it. I would try to figure out what they don't like. I mean, the L-Y you can throw in anywhere. Every sentence has a verb. Just check and find one that needs a stronger verb. You've got nouns all over the place, so there's your quality adjective. Maybe the confusion is in parts of speech. I don't know. If the who, which is the one driving them crazy, show them how they can change a that into a, a who or a which. Or they're 12 and 14, you might be able to show them the invisible which, which would be kind of cool. And the one while word senses of although goes there. I like to get those dress up solid because that's where you get that continuous reinforcement of parts of speech and basic grammar ideas, clauses, and refine the sentence openers off that. So I would try to figure out what it is that overwhelms them about the dress ups and maybe play a game and say, hey, here's three random words. Try to write a sentence with these three words that uses all five of the dress ups. And remember, once you get into the fifth sentence opener, you drop the because. So you can go ahead and drop the because dress up and make that better. Deborah, I am guessing you're saying your kids hate labeling the dress ups. I am guessing that what they don't like is putting the little thing in the margin that we used to have in the theme based writing lesson books. Um, I don't do that at all. My system is just to underline one of each of the dress ups. So you find one L-Y word, underline. You can have two, you can have three, it doesn't matter. You underline one. Same thing. You find one strong verb, underline it. Find one quality adjective, underline. Then I can quickly go one, two, three, four, five. Okay, you got them all. Or one, two, three, four. Okay, what's missing? Oh, you're missing the who, which. Okay, now let's talk about how to fit that in. So I wouldn't uh, at all require them to put the little thing in the margin for the dress-ups. I would just say, you know, underline it and... 
uh, or you know you could print two copies and have them mark one. I don't. I guess I wonder why do they hate labeling? That would be the question to ask. All right, last question. Andrew, this is for Anne-Marie. Andrew, IW seems to be teacher-driven, which is fine, yet the schooled world seems to emphasize independence from middle schoolers. So helping the student with IEW lessons was different, but I'm glad I understand that I am to assist. And it is working really well. Great. I just assumed the child was to be more independent solely because of his age and grade level. Yeah, see, the problem today, Anne-Marie, is that age and grade level don't mean anything except you are approximately X years old. Just because you're in grade five, it doesn't mean you've actually learned anything, right? Just because you're the age of grade seven doesn't mean you have experience. Now, once upon a time, being in grade five meant that you had learned uh, the skills and information that you were responsible to graduate grade four. And if you didn't, you just stay in grade four until you could do that. And that, of course, would be very easy in kind of a one-room schoolhouse environment. But once we went away from that and age segregated students, then it became a stigma to not move on. And so now kids move on to the next grade, regardless of their ability, their experience, their mastery, their knowledge. And we, you know, we imitate that even in the homeschool world. We'll just say, you know, well, my child is in fifth grade, but he reads more like a third grader and he does math like a third grader and his spelling is, I don't know, maybe a second grader. Well, okay. What you're telling me is your child is approximately 10 and a half, 11 years old, and he's still learning at a level other than what would correspond in the real world with his age. So I think if we can get away from that idea and say, okay, whatever age you are, you start here, you do it until it becomes easy, then you add the next thing, you keep going, and it's a pathway that you're walking. And the best analogy, I guess, you know, my background is as a violin teacher. And the great thing about violin is you can start when you're four or when you're 14 or when you're 40. It doesn't matter. You can spend six months on book one. You can take two years to get through book one. It doesn't matter. And it, what also doesn't matter is what other kids your age are doing because everybody started at a different time and goes at different speed. All that matters is that you're making progress, that you are doing today what is a little bit better, a little more mature, a little more... Uh, stylish, a little easier than what was being done yesterday or the week before or the month before. So that should be your, your assessment guide is, is there progress happening here? And I get from your comment that yes, you said it's working really well. So that's the clue. Keep doing what works really well. There were a lot of questions, and I'm grateful that I was able to get through all of them. I hope sufficiently. If any of you still have a question or the answer I gave was not complete enough for you, well, send it in to our podcast, and we can use it for the Ask Andrew Anything. And if it's a good enough question, maybe we can do you know a, a whole podcast talking about that. And if that's not to your liking, you can ask, email it in. We have got a great team of support people. If someone who gets that question can't answer it or feel confident answering, they'll kick it up to someone else with more experience, and we can kick it up to people who have been teaching this practically as long as I have and do it better than me and no more. So we will get every question answered because we really care about you. We want you to be successful. And I hope this has pumped you up with a lot of positive and happy energy. Thank you so much. Thanks to my wonderful staff, Cameron, our technical side, Julie, always on hand to answer every question. God bless you and good night. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudois and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on this educational journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking. Thank you.